Dina, welcome. Welcome to my gentle stroll through Causley's Lanson. I'm Rob Tremaine, local lad, lived here all my life and consider Lanson as the centre of the universe. Lanson's a hilltop frontier town and the view coming across Polson Bridge from England looking at that skyline of Lanson is absolutely fantastic. John Betjeman put it rather well, I think. Travellers coming out of Devon lift up their hearts at the sight of Lanson. And I hope that after today's tour, you'll come and explore the town for yourselves. We start our tour here at the Castle Gate, looking across Guildhall Square to Lanson's civic buildings. Before the war, Charles played in a dance band and of course he'd be very familiar with the town hall itself. The guild hall was built in 1881 and the town hall completed in 1887 to celebrate Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee. The clock dates from 1842 and came from the butter market building that used to be in the town square. The quarter jacks, a little older again, date from the 1600s originally from Hexworthy House, down near Greystone Bridge, the home of Colonel Bennett. Not the nicest of Lanson's characters. We'll hear a bit more about him later on. Charles wrote a poem on the Quarter Jacks. Tim and Tom, the quarter boys on the Guildhall Tower, turn and strike the quarter bell 20 times an hour. The Guildhall was built in 1881 and it cost £1,275. The Town Hall was completed in 1887 to celebrate Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee. That cost £1,965. Think what it would be today. The clock dates from 1842 and came from the butter market that used to be in the town square. The Quarter Jacks, they were originally on Hexworthy House, the seat of Colonel Bennett, big country house down near Greystone Bridge on the River Tamer. He was a parliamentarian, local tradition has it, that Cromwell himself stayed with him at Hexworthy back in 1642. He wasn't the nicest of Lanson's characters. He purchased the castle in Deer Park from the Commonwealth Parliament, and he appointed the jailer. We'll hear about him later on. We're stood here in this great Barbican gateway, the main entrance into the town's castle. A little different when it was bright and shiny and new. This was the level of the walkway. If you can picture this stretching out across to where the town hall is now, this was the bridge that got you across the moat into the castle. Planks of wood laid across. If an enemy or trouble was on its way, they'd be pulled back and it would be pretty difficult to get into the old place through the mire and muck of the moat. St Stephen's was a market town when Lanson was a fuzzy down, so goes the old rhyme. When we were youngsters I went to windmill school and in the summer we used to play cricket against St Stephen's and they used to chant this doggerel verse at us. It used to get us quite upset but there was a reason behind it because St Stephen's was the original Lanson, the original Lan Stephan. Lan Stephan, Cornish language, Lan meaning a holy enclosure, Stephen, Stephen, and then the sort of the Saxon ton added on to the end. So Lan Stephan ton transmogrified over the years into Launceston or Lanson that we know today. Pretty important place a thousand years ago, a market, royal mint, priory church, centre of the community, a bustling, busy little market town. 1066 changed all that. 
Lanson was one of the estates granted to Robert, Earl of Mortain, half-brother to William the Conqueror. He was the greatest landowner in the country after the king, and he held most of Cornwall. The Normans chose this steep hilltop town of Dunheved with its wooden hill fort, an ideal place for a defensive castle to be built. So the market, the seat of government, all moved across here from St. Stephen's. Gradually, the people themselves moved to the safety of the new walled town growing up around the castle, and they brought their name with them. So Dunheved became Launceston, and today it's still Dunheved, otherwise Lanson, on all documents. The castle was the main administrative base for Cornwall and the surrounding countryside here at Lanson. In 1166, it became the base for the Assize Courts and the Great Hall was extended in stone. The, the Castle Green is a wonderful outdoor space used by us locals and visitors. Beautiful views of the Deer Park, the Willow Gardens, St. Stephen's and the Kenzie Valley. Charles knew these grounds intimately. One of his poems in the Willow Gardens, they were the town allotments. As we know, Charles wrote lots of poems concerning his beloved Lanson and several concerning the castle. But one that I think of is the Willow Gardens. He pictures the two old boys working their allotment plot, not really seeing what was going on behind them. In the Willow Gardens, I don't hear Tom nor Jack, but I can see the huntsmen along the forest track. All through the Willow Gardens, I see them riding plain, the Iron Dukes of Normandy and Robert of Mortain. They ride along by Harper's Lake, beside the water clear. They hunt the hare, they hunt the boar, they hunt the running deer. Hark, I hear the hoofbeats, I hear the hunters cry, I hear them blow the hunting horn, I see the arrows fly. Don't you see them, Tommy? Don't you hear them, Jack? How they ride by the stream side, to the woods end and back? But Tommy shakes his silver head, and Jackie slaps his knee. There's nothing there, says Jack to Tom. Mez is a brush, says he. The castle was the main administrative center for Lanson and the surrounding area. In 1166, the Great Hall was extended and rebuilt in stone. You can imagine the folks coming from all over to receive their justice from their Norman lords. Richard, the Earl of Cornwall, rebuilt the castle in stone. He built the high tower inside the keep and raised the height of the walls, built guard towers, etc. He confirmed Lanson as a free borough, thus giving the town similar rights to those of London and allowed the town to build a guild hall. The county jail was situated here in the Castle Green for many years, right until 1829 when it finally moved to the purpose-built jail in Bodmin. Prior to that, the jail was here in this gatehouse of the castle, known as Doomsdale. It says it all, doesn't it? Many important prisoners were kept in Doomsdale. You can see the slots where the portcullis used to slide up and down the gateway. And the second story above me here was demolished in the 1820s because it was unsafe. Carew, in his 1602 survey of Cornwall says, for activity, one kilter committed to Lanson jail for the Cornish commotion, lying there in the green upon his back, threw a stone of some pounds weight over the tower which leads into the park. Kilter was from Constantine down near Helston and he was committed to the jail for the murder of William Boddy, one of the king's commissioners 
during the Prayer Book Rebellion. In June 1577, Cuthbert Main, a young Roman Catholic priest, was arrested at Golden Manor near Tregony and conveyed to Lunson Jail. And it wasn't until the September Assizes that over a score of persons came before the justices. Four months in this terrible jail before they even came to trial. Think of that. Maine was condemned to hanging, drawing and quartering and on St Andrew's Day 1577 was dragged through the streets of the town on a hurdle to the market square where he was executed. John Hodge was also thrown into jail at this time. He was a servant of Francis Trudgeon, where Maine was down at Golden Manor near Tregony. He was sent to Lanson Jail with clean clothes for the prisoner. He was imprisoned himself. After four years in jail, he was pardoned. Can you imagine four years in this stinking hole of a jail? There were rooms above the gatehouse where the jailer and the gatekeeper lived. And if you stand under the arch, you can see the slots where the portcullis used to slide up and down and the huge hinges for the wooden gates. The second story of the gatehouse was demolished in the 1800s, deemed unsafe. While in Cornwall back in 1656, George Fox was imprisoned here. They were here for nine weeks before being escorted to trial. He describes it well in his journal, a nasty, stinking place where they used to put murderers after they were condemned. The place was so noisome it was observed that few that went in ever came out again in health. It was all mire, in some places the tops of our shoes in water and urine, and the jailer would not let us cleanse it, nor suffer us to have beds of straw to lie upon. That was the jailer that Colonel Bennett imposed upon the poor unfortunates who were here in the castle jail. The Eagle House Hotel was originally a town house built using local bricks in about 1764 by Corrington Carpenter, constable of the castle. Out of his winnings on a lottery, the lottery prize was £10,000 about 1,340,000 in today's pennies, a lot of dosh. It enabled him to marry his fiancée, build the house and live happily ever after. It's suggested that the eagles represent the imperial eagles of Napoleon and Britannia on the rooftop modelled on Marianne, the symbol of France. One of Charles's wonderful poems of Lanson, Eagle One and Eagle Two. Tell the tale. They bring in the quarter jacks from the town hall as well, and lots of little Lanson snippets. Eagle One and Eagle Two standing on the wall. Your wings are spread or made of lead. You never fly at all. High on the roof, Britannia holds her fishing prong. And she and they, as white as clay, stand still the whole day long. One looks to the eastward, one to the setting sun, and one looks down upon the town until the day is done. But when the quarter jacks their twelve upon the black town beat, when the moon's a golden balloon blowing down Castle Street, then with her spear Britannia the eagles both will guide to drink their fill under the hill down by the riverside. And when the town hall quarter jacks the hour of one beat plain, eagles and queen may all be seen on roof and wall again. But now I'm a grown man and I hear the midnight bell and ask is it true the tale I knew that still the children tell? I only know at midnight softly I go by nor do I look at roof and wall, do not ask me why. 
Castle Street has been described by Betjeman as the finest Georgian street in Cornwall. Castle Hill House was built for the Lanson solicitor Thomas Jago, and he's buried next to the porch in St. Mary's Churchyard. In the 1800s, a number of French naval officers captured in the Napoleonic Wars were placed on parole and sent to Lanson, where they lodged with local business families. Their headquarters was here at number nine Castle Street, Lawrence House. There are several records of marriages in the registers of St. Mary's Church to a French prisoner of parole, married so-and-so, 1809. Lawrence House is the town's museum, and it's well worth a visit. This imposing town house was built in 1753 by Humphrey Lawrence, an attorney and sometime mayor of Lanson. He died in 1811, aged 42, and the mayor and corporation, along with many tradespeople of the town, escorted his coffin from Page's Cross to St Mary's Church to be buried in the family vault at midnight. Can you see the date carved into one of the bricks? In 1914, the porch was added to the building and a small cottage demolished and a brick extension built by the Reverend Thomas Northmorth Smith Pierce with bay windows and upper floors. They blend together pretty well. And then in the 1870s, two cottages were demolished and a house built, now number 11, the dentists. Here we are in the pedestrianised Northgate Street, which ran from the North Gate up to St Mary's Church, one of the main roads from the north into Lanson. Looking down the hill, beautiful view of St Thomas Hill, St Thomas Church down in the trees at the bottom, and on the right a slate-hung 18 St Thomas Hill, where Charles lived as a boy, and he wrote the poem Forbidden Games, remembering when he was seven and his father Charlie lay dying upstairs. A lifetime, and I see them still, my aunt, my mother, silently held by the stove's unflinching eye inside the tall house scaled with slate. The paper boy runs up the hill, cries echo to the black brown sky. The tin clock on the kitchen shelf taps seven, and I am seven, and I lie flat on the floor playing a game of snakes and ladders by myself. Well, here we are in the old Northgate Street. The old houses here are all that remain of the old Northgate Street houses. The remainder were demolished in the 1960s to enable new council housing to be built. Ram Alley, Harvey's Lane, Duke Lane, three alleys that connected Northgate Street to Tower Street. Wonderful views here looking across to St Stephen's, the golf course and along the Kenzie Valley. Charming little cottages. There were lots of pubs in Lanson. That's something I haven't mentioned before. Um, Ring of Bells Cottage. This was a pub, funnily enough, called the Ring of Bells. Sadly, no more. I'm working up a thirst. The Wesley Methodist Church was built in 1870 at a cost of £5,000 on the site of earlier chapels. The architects, James Hine and Alfred Norman of Plymouth. It was one of the finest chapels in the county. Bath, Portland and Polyphant were the types of stone used in its construction with granite facings. The Sunday school continued to expand, as did the men's class, which rapidly outgrew all the available space. And in 1891, the Dingley Institute, costing £700, was dedicated. Fine stained glass with the sower as its theme, just to my left here. The spire was a constant cause of concern, many repairs over the years, but sadly in 1984 it had to de be demolished, the loss of a Lanson landmark. The coming of the railways in 1865 brought renewed prosperity to the town, 
many town centre buildings were renewed. The opening of the Liberal Club was designed by local architect Otho Peter, delayed due to the death of Gladstone on the 17th of June, 1898, refurbished in 2009. Fine building here in the town. Tower Street takes its name from the tower of St. Mary Magdalene Parish Church, which is the only part of the original building left standing. The tower was built in 1380 on the instructions of Edward the Black Prince, the first Duke of Cornwall. The new oak door was made and hung by Clifford Joinery in 2018. The earliest record of a public clock in Cornwall is that of St. Mary's. Not the existing clock, it's in a pretty poor state. Funds are being raised for a complete restoration. There's a lovely story of Taffy Hughes. Came to Ludson during the war and stayed. Labour member of Lanson Town Council. Mayor on occasions. And I remember as a boy meeting Mr Hughes here in the street and he said, Hello Robert, he said. Do you know the biggest two-faced liar in Lanson? And I said, no, I don't, Mr. Hughes. He said, it's St. Mary's church clock. It's different times on both sides. Well done. <laughs> At the top of Tower Street, just around the corner from St. Mary's church is the old Bell Inn, probably used by masons and carpenters who came to Lanson to build the church. Parts of the property date back to the 14th century. In 1771, mentioned as made 14 lodging rooms and stabling for 50 horses. 1822, freight service to Boscastle by T. Avery started at the Bell Inn. And Mr. Davy and son ran a service to Stratton and Bude every Wednesday, Thursday and Saturday, also starting from the Bell Inn. There was a slaughterhouse and a large covered skittle alley described in 1847. A busy place, far larger than it is today, with the building of the Liberal Club just around the corner. That took away part of the old bell. There's a set of murals painted in 1951 showing scenes of old Lanson. Well worth a visit to the Bell Inn. Look into the lounge bar to see these murals. One's called the Stag Hunt, and it depicts a rowdy crowd below the upper windows of a house, banging pots and pans to attract the inhabitants. Causley's poem, Stang Hunt, recalls one such occurrence in 1921, when the family lived in St. Thomas Hill. Stang Hunt, waking, Aged four, I heard under the steep window a hunting horn, a scat of tin trays, kitchen pans, sycamore whistles, hob nails punishing the hill. In my nightshirt, I ran to where my mother, father, drew an inch of curtain back. The oil lamp thinned to a wafer of light, half gold, half winking blue. I caught a blare of torches and rough song. Stang hunt. It means the man was wicked to his family, is what my father said. Beneath my naked feet, unseen, unknown, trembled the first small shock of ice, of stone. The Church of St. Mary Magdalene was rebuilt from 1511 to 1524 thanks to the generosity of Henry Tricarroll. Henry Tricarroll, prominent person within Lanson, mayor on occasions, lived at Tricarroll Manor, Les Ant. Baby son was born and he was rebuilding his manor house. The story goes that the babe drowned in the basin of water as it was being bathed. And instead of rebuilding his manor house at Tricarroll, 
The stonemasons, the stone, the carpenters were all sent into Lance and to rebuild the crumbling parish church in memory of his son. It's built from Cornish granite, very hard, very strong. Over the porch gates, you can see St. George fighting the dragon and St. Martin cutting his cloak in half to share with the beggar. There's a windmill, a manor house, intricate carvings around the church itself. Ostrich plumes from the arms of the Duke of Cornwall, pomegranate from the arms of Catherine of Aragon, wife of Henry VIII, during which time the church was being built. Valerian, nardus, pomegranate flowers, the seeds of which all combined to make the spikenard ointment used by Mary Magdalene to anoint the feet of our Lord. Lots of symbolism carved into the granite here. Well, here we are at the east end of St. Mary's Church. The recumbent St. Mary Magdalene lying under this great east window, surrounded on either side by the minstrels of St. Mary's, climbing either side of the window. The minstrels were familiar in Lanson, many references to them in the old borough accounts. 1450, for example, wine expended in the night of Mary Magdalene between the mayor and the minstrels. And 1467, for bread, three flagons and one quart of wine expanded by the mayor and his companions and the minstrels of the blessed Mary Magdalene. They didn't only support the mayor in his civic duties, but they took part in occasional church services. One of the customs of St. Mary's minstrels was to accompany the mayor to the top of the steep hill outside the south gate to greet important visitors to the town. The mayor and councillors, the burgesses, would all be lined up waiting to greet the visitors. A bishop's visitation in those days was an important occasion. And on the 15th of June, 1540, Bishop Lacey was toiling up the steep hill from the valley beneath. He was greatly cheered by the strains that reached him from the top of the hill, and he exclaimed, surely it is the angels singing. And then and there, the name of Angel Hill was given to the hill, and it's still Angel Hill to this day. And when a Visit from the Bishop of Truro on his first visit to Lanson. The Mayor and Corporation and the Choir of St. Mary Magdalene welcomed the Bishop with a musical welcome. A tradition of the town, if you stand with your back to St. Mary Magdalene and throw a small pebble over your shoulder. Ah. It didn't fall on the back of the saint, so I'm not going to get a suit of new clothes. Story of my life. Um, we know this is the Causley Festival, and Charles wrote several poems relating to his beloved Lanson. I'm sure you're all familiar with them. I'll read a couple of verses from a couple of his poems regarding St. Mary Magdalene's church, just to perhaps whet your appetite and you can look them up for yourselves on another occasion. Mary, Mary Magdalene, Mary, Mary Magdalene, lying on the wall, I throw a pebble on your back, will it lie or fall? Send me down for Christmas, some stockings and some hose, and send before the winter's end a brand new suit of clothes. Mary, Mary Magdalene, under a stony tree, I throw a pebble on your back. What will you send me? And so the poem continues. The True Ballad of Henry Tricarroll, the benefactor, builder of this church. Henry Tricarroll sat up in bed. His face was white and his eyes were red. I dreamed, he cried, that our son was dead. Lie over, Sir Henry, her ladyship said. I saw him sink in a silver fen in the arms of a wicked white Magdalene. I hope I'm imagining things. 
Only then her ladyship muttered, Amen, Amen. The moon walks west on the orchard wall. Your daughters are dozing over the hall, and your son sleep to sound as a cannonball. There's nothing the matter, Sir Henry, at all. But when the boy baby, as naked as sin, stood up in a cold Cornish basin of tin, his nurse went away for a little napkin, and he fell in the water and breathed it all in. It's a very thoughtful poem telling the tale of the building of this fabulous church here in Lanson. I think this would be a suitable spot to end my stroll this morning. There's a lot more to take in, but perhaps we'll save that for another day. I hope you've enjoyed this brief wander through Charles's footsteps around his beloved Lanson and come and visit us again when you're able. Thank you.